So, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are listening to what is now the third episode of the 40 Rules of Love, where we are discussing Shams of Tabriz's 40 Rules, hopefully two at a time in each episode. And my name is Elizabeth Carney, and I am your host for this evening, for this um, Silver Tent TV production. So um, I hope you enjoy the discussion. And before we get into the rules that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to introduce you. Well, actually, I'm going to ask this uh, panel of ladies to briefly introduce themselves. And then we will start looking at today's rules, which are numbers five and six, which in a minute I will pop up on the screen. So in order of appearance uh, and where you are on my screen, can I first ask you to introduce yourself, Conchata? Yes. Good evening, everybody. And thanks for um, allowing me to be part of this panel. Um, I am an American living in France, and um, I think that's about all you need to know. I'm a member of, of the Silver Ten and Silver Synergy, and I am looking forward to the discussion today. Okay, thank you. And next, moving on to Emily. Uh, hello, I'm Emily. Um, uh, I create beautiful events which connect people, bring us all together and generate love. Uh, love by name, love by nature. <laughs> and last but not least, Christine, would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Christine Miller. Um, I'm a, a long-time student of love in many contexts and of the meaning of love and the possibility for experiencing love at work in the workplace and in the boardroom. Um, I'm an English woman also living in France like Conchetta and um, yes I'm a poet and an author and just love being surrounded by love so there we go that's me. How wonderful, perfect for these discussions. And me, I am also an author and a coach with obviously a profound interest in love. And I have to say this, the book where these 40 rules first appeared had a profound effect on me. One of the um, most profound effects that a book has had on me in a long time. And this idea for these panel discussions came up at a Silver Tent Book Club meeting um, where we were looking at that very book and it seemed like a good idea to discuss the rules. So here we go. Now, it's easier we found to pop them up on the screen so we can all um, see. So uh, let's start with the one we're going to look at first today. So the first one, rule number five, um, which we even touched on last episode. So if anybody um, hasn't watched that or episode one, you know, please go and find them because there's some fascinating discussions. But tonight we're kicking off with rule number five. Most of the problems of the world stem from linguistic mistakes and simple misunderstanding. Don't ever take words at face value. When you step into the zone of love, language as we know it becomes obsolete. That which cannot be put into words can only be grasped through silence. So what a wonderful concept. So let's kick it off with you, Concerta, please. And your first thoughts about, about this particular rule. Well, like you, uh, because of reading the book, I, I was moved, and and when when I even now, and that was what three or four months ago, I I think about it, and every time I look at a rule, 
it's as if it it offers me the opportunity to do a personal inquiry. It's like somewhere deep inside of me, there are no words just like this one is talking about, but even inside of me, I can feel the, um, oh God, I can't even explain it because it's like th the only thing I can do is sit with it in silence is, is that it's very difficult to explain the impact and, and the shifting, um, when we stop talking um, and, and I find that in, in interacting with people, I'm, I'm an empath. And of course, even if people are talking, I'm much more aware of what's going on behind the scene or the, uh, the energetics that are going on. Um, and <clears throat> even in those situations, um, I find that if I will drop in, if, if it's a, say a tense situation or or if there's um yeah some disagreements or conflicts i find that if i will drop in if i will be quiet and and if i drop into a a space of love we'll, we'll call it if i just internally find that spark in me that even if it's a teeny little place in there it shifts the energy around me um so I would agree with most of the problems of the, of the world stem from li linguistic mistakes. I mean, we can we can laugh at it. We can see how we've um, these modern texts that we do. They they make they make all kinds of posts on social media about the funny ones when we are we are not saying the right things or or excuse me auto 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 correct goes into action. Um, and I guess I don't really want to talk so much about the stuff going on around the world, but it seems to me that there's a lot of issues, um, misunderstandings going on. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, I, I'll I'll stop right there for now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'd I'd agree with you. I mean, this whole business of social media and um texting and you know misunderstanding and people making assumptions from their own position to put words in other people's mouths i mean i've had some trolls and some haters recently somebody said that's because you've arrived but i'm like i'm going out with an intention of love and what comes back is phenomenal i'm like how on earth did you read that how did you get that out of what i wrote and and I think sometimes people see what they want to see because they've got a platform where they can say what they want to say or they think they can. Um, and this, I love this, don't ever take the words at face value because everybody has their own perspective and the same words and the same sentence can mean completely different things to different people. So, yeah, on that note... I'm going to ask Emily for your perspective on, on this rule number five. I hate calling them rules, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm a rule breaker. And I think it's quite interesting that they're called rules, whether we should actually, you know, consider that as a something to be obeyed or not. Um, I think... Um... First of all, I, I I want to say yes to this one. It it, it just yes, <laughs> I agree. Um, it is very moving. This notion of um, the true meaning of what you're saying can only be grasped through silence in this very noisy world um, and it makes me think of um, that sort of yeah lost in translation so even when you're talking about the word rule the name of the book the 40 rules of love that word rule has probably a different translation so for example um 
Sanskrit, that language which has a resonance which can uh, shift your um, state. Um, it's it's translate it's translation into let's say English the language that we're talking now. There's very often no literal translation, so the meaning is the 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 the, re the real meaning is isn't the same. So, for example, and this by the way is from the film Arrival, which I was talking about last night. Um, um, it says that the in Sanskrit the 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 meaning of the word war translates to a desire for more cows <sighs> and <laughs> and so you can kind of see well i really can see feel and sense from that right the 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 total difference in um environments so the whole <laughs> bible was you know in in Aramathaic, the original language, the meaning. Have you ever come across the um, the the uh, the so called original translation of the Lord's Prayer? The words, the meaning, is very different from the meaning that um, a lot of us were spoke in school. Um, at, so um it's gone hasn't it the it's the, the the slide's gone oh do you want me I, to put it back I can't up really go back to it my memory um i don't know if i'll need it but i was going to say i think i need it yeah thanks <laughs> um oh yeah and just to just to say it, yeah a little bit on from what concetta was saying um the 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 way that we communicate um, on social media, Facebook and Instagram and, you know, um, what was Twitter? Um, it's like everyone's quick, ready to respond, not listening to hear. And um, it's so uh, easy to misconstrue the meaning of what somebody else is saying because you know just like the 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 desire for more cows we haven't been through their experience and we're not living in their land and it it's sort of like this internal dialogue that we might share on facebook and then maybe it connects up with somebody it's just right maybe it doesn't it's just rife for misconstruing so I just love this um, rule, rule <laughs> five, a great deal. I think it's um, just beautiful. We, you know, oh, and one other thing is that, you know, um, uh, that thing about how when you speak, uh, it's actually only 7% of what you say that we're listening to um oh because everything the, it's in the body language is it in your tonality um and so we're missing all of that when we're not sitting with each other in silence i oh it is a marvelous film called la belle Vere where they sit in concerts of silence which really uh, appeals to me um yeah if you sit with someone for an hour if we did an, a silent zoom <laughs> wow. who knows who knows what we might feel together. That's me done for the moment. <laughs> Thanks. Wow. Yeah, that is an interesting concept to uh, to move on to, a silent Zoom. Fascinating. So, Christine, over to you. Okay, so... Um... Starting with the words and talking about Sanskrit. Um, Sanskrit, in fact, has 96 words for love. And, of course, the English language has one. So, certainly, there's a, a paucity of vocabulary 
if we're going to go into having verbal exchanges, um, I, that's something that I discovered through all my research about love and the depths of meaning of what love is for me is certainly that love is a state and a way of being and living. And whilst I've been wanting to draw out what love means to all the people I've spoken to, which is now in the hundreds, um, the best exchanges take place in silence and in the spaces between the words. And that comes really to a, a sort of linguistic thing about the word in connected speech, that a word taken individually is one thing, but when we bring our words together in a flow, it's more like a, a song of meaning rather than an individual stark word sitting there. And yet, the silent conversations where the energy connects and the meaning comes through is, I think I've mentioned this before, that I've discovered that it's vitally important that I become that I embody love, that I become love. When I go to ask people what love means to them, that they can sense me as a loving, a loving space. They can sense me as um, a loving body, and they can sense that I have that loving well-being at heart for them. And of course, in our modern world. This has, as we've discussed already, this has dissipated enormously because we, we rely immensely on the written word. Whereas in early days, in medieval times, and really until people became educated and could read and write, it was a verbal tradition. So things, the words were not set in stone. The words came from the head and the heart, and the best words always come straight from the heart. If we can connect, if we can learn to connect the heart, the feelings, that feeling of caring, that feeling of being surrounded by love. So taking words at face value, um, it's it's a very rushed thing, isn't it? Our, our world is very full, very busy. The pace is enormous. And there's not that sense of being able to be quiet. I just, I always think there's so much value in the pause. There's so much value in the way we speak to one another, that when that allowing space for listening, and understanding, listening to understand, not to respond, just listening, being there as someone who values and appreciates and regards someone else's words as treasures. That makes a huge difference to the way we understand and the way we can understand one another. So when we do step into the zone of love, Words do become obsolete because we can see each other, we can feel each other. And you know, one of the exercises that I've practiced and been taught and used so many times is that silent gazing, you know, mutual gazing. <clears throat> it's one of the first things that um, a mother is recommended to do with a newborn baby is to it is to hold the baby, look into their eyes and connect 
with this external version of what you've been carrying so lovingly for the past nine months or so. And when we do that with people, I've, I've been able to actually create that sense of bonding in silence through, a, through a, the zoom of a camera on Zoom. If you, you can, you know, I've, I've had these crazy moments where I've made someone get up really, really close to me so that we gaze into each other's eyes and we share the energy. So whilst I love words and I'm a poet and a wordsmith, I value silence enormously. Uh, and I think we have to become wiser globally in how we how we treat words um, and to place more emphasis on deep understanding and caring and learning to deliver words from love when we do use them, but to maintain the loving energy as often as we can. Being human beings, we're going to slip up sometimes, mm -hmm. but love love is at the core. And it needs to be brought out far more so that we we can regain a more peaceful world full of love and without warlike words. Uh, absolutely. That is that is beautiful. And it just it just reminded me actually of um of a situation with um with a particular lover for example those moments where no words are required where you can sit and either gaze into each other's eyes no words are needed just the being and this one person i recall in particular just being present together the energy that we felt that you know there were no words spoken but there was like this always this huge zing of energy like the communication was going on some completely different other level and that only becomes apparent in the silence when we can listen when we can listen to the silence i wrote a poem a few weeks ago that you know, talked about, you know, silence. Silence is not golden. Si silence is, um, I'd love to find it. It was, it was all about silence being infinite, but there is so much noise in that infinity because everything is in there. And if we are able to listen to the silence, we can learn so much more. And it's one thing with a lover, but I too have done that exercise, Christine, with with almost strangers and just that power of staring into each other's eyes is phenomenal. What you realise, what you see, what you understand about the other person in that moment, you can't put into words. So, yeah. Anybody like to add to that? Yeah, Conchetta. Just, yeah. I had a couple of stories that, that, that Christine, when she was talking, that reminded me. I have a, a, a quick, I have a friend who, an American who moved here to France. And one, he's not very good with language, but he's a, he is a, a, a award-winning uh, director, producer. He makes films. So he came to France and basically said, we can do this without learning each other's languages. And, you know, it, to, to some extent, I, I knew where he was going with this, but at the same time, it's like, eh, well, maybe not so much with some of the administrators. However, he, he sent me a story one day. He said, I was on the tram. He said, I, I need to prove my point. I'm on the tram here. And he looks over and there's a woman sobbing. And He's looking at her and he says, you know, he went over and tried to talk to her. She didn't understand him. He didn't understand her, but he just gave her a tissue. And there it was. 
that exactly what rule five is talking about is that there was nothing and what you were talking all of us are talking about there's not in that moment he was extending love and and to me that that proved it and it's true i mean we don't necessarily have to speak anything and and we can just sense what is in front of us and how to take action I think the sensing is the bigger. I mean, I don't know if any of you would agree with me. I've heard the words, I love you, from people. I go, nah, I, you know, you don't, I don't feel that love. So sometimes the words are just, they're redundant, obsolete, unnecessary, they're lies, mm -hmm. you know, even though the, yeah, and the, the silence and the being and the looking at each other, is far more powerful than the actual those words that every every teenage girl is desperate to hear from her boyfriend I, and <laughs> you know Emily yeah no I just said and boy every oh, teenage yeah. girl and boy <laughs> yeah yeah well every teenager yeah yes yeah so anything more to add on rule number five, anybody, or should we have a look at number six? I'm, I'm thinking, you know, one of the questions we asked in, in episodes one and two was, um, is this rule still relevant today? And I think probably out of all of them that we've looked at so far, this one is absolutely 100% profoundly relevant. Yeah. Yeah, it really is nodding, so take that as so let's have a look at number six um the reason the reason i removed the slides and that number six is a long one is because then we get a a closer up view of whoever is um speaking at the time so rule number six loneliness and solitude are two different things when you're lonely, it's easy to delude yourself into believing that you're on the right path. Solitude is better for us as it means being alone without feeling lonely. But eventually it's the best to find a person who will be your mirror. Remember, only in another person's heart can you truly see yourself and the presence of God within you. So how about that one? Christine, do you want to kick off with this one? Yes, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so, what's, what immediately springs to mind is, is um, Wordsworth's poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or fails and hills. Um, the poem, obviously, about, about daffodils. And... I, from a personal perspective, definitely know the difference between loneliness and solitude. And I've always, um, I've always respected and cherished my solitude from being, from being quite young. I've never ever been bothered by being alone um, and not feeling lonely. Um, there are times when it, loneliness can creep in because perhaps you're facing stressful circumstances and it's good to have people around you with whom you can share your your worries, your concerns, and not the imaginary ones, but the you know the real practical problems of life that do arise for us all from time to time. Um, and I I've, I've been married um, to my husband for uh, a long time, 
Um, I'm just trying to think how long it is. 48 years um, I've been married. So, uh, And we have spent periods of time apart when he, my, my husband was working overseas. And there were times then when I felt, definitely felt, lonely coping with life life at home with two children etc but i've never been bothered by being being alone i mean i can go into solitude whilst reading a book and you could try to speak to me and i used to drive my mother insane that that she that i'd be so engrossed in in my study or my book that i just wouldn't be able to acknowledge that there was anyone else around and that was a kind of solitude where where i i flourished you know i that was something i find i need solitude to be able to write my poetry and i need solitude to be able to to think in universal terms universal like bigger even than global terms when when i think about the changes and the transformations that I want to see, not only in myself, but in, in the world as a whole. Those are the times when, when I really value my solitude. Um, and I feel that it feeds my heart, it feeds my intellect, it feeds everything about me. Um, I don't know whether I suppose, in a way, my my husband is and has been my mirror, um, because I I see myself reflected in him as a, a totally loving being, and I that is just so precious, and that is part of of solitude, and it seems like he and I can have solitude together which is an amazing thing and that just remember only in another person's heart can you see, truly see yourself and the presence of God within you I'm not certain I entirely agree with that um, but I can see elements of it in relationships where there is that openness and that commitment to loving understanding so I can see how that could be part of the um, the precepts around love mm -hmm. so yeah I think I think I'm done with that for now okay um well lots lots to think about there I mean I I you know the whole thing about loneliness and solitude I mean I've experienced both and you know I also know what it's like to feel lonely in a crowd um you know where you're surrounded by people but somehow don't feel like you quite belong there or there's something not quite right um so it's 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 quite this it's almost like you know there's 40 rules but you could divide all these rules up into you know, further individual components, I think, because there's there's more than one aspect to most of them. And, you know, that's also why I put a gap between the first part and the second part, because I think I'm inclined to agree with you about not necessarily agreeing with the, um, you know, only seeing yourself and the presence of God within you in another person's heart. I mean, yeah. maybe it helps, but whether it's the only thing, that's another matter so Emily I just sorry just can I just very briefly that 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 last sentence reminds me um of, of a of a sentence in the pretty prince the little prince where oh, nice. the fox says it's only with the eyes of the heart that you can truly see um that's not the full quote and it's probably misquoted but that just kind of reminds me that perhaps only not in but through another person's heart and your own heart can you truly see yourself and the presence of God within you 
and now I'll be quiet. <laughs> Oh, maybe, yeah. So, Emily, how how do you respond to that? Oh, I just want to say, Christine, that's so cool because that's exactly what I was go wanted to say. The little prince. I think it's something like uh, uh, it's only through the eyes of the heart that we can really see the sky, or something like that. Um, and again, I I I think. Oh, I don't know which order to say this in. Like the translation again. That translation from from French to English and this translation it's it's we we're talking about it quite uh, yeah we're talking about it in a I think in a multi-sensory way uh, and when you look at it like literally sometimes it doesn't quite make sense but um, I'm going to just come back to that I think in a minute so that's fine. Do you need me to leave this up? Yeah, please leave it up because it's. Please, I, I know it looks really good on the screen when you can see us big, but particular. Well, maybe with all of them, but I feel like particularly this one, I need to keep referring to it because it's so got so many um, convoluted aspects. Right. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, that thing about loneliness and aloneness is such a big theme uh in my life and work and yeah um I really feel how important it is that creativity um that connection to the muse it's so um it's so beautiful to be doing that when you're alone and yet also like you know you could be doing um what um you know improvising in a band so then that's a kind of a mutual oh sorry you've just she's just put the quote in the thingy <laughs> and oh. now here is my secret a very simple secret it is only with the heart that one can see rightly what is essential is invisible to the eye. That, so that last sentence is so similar to that. Christine just put mm. that quote in the chat. Yeah. So I read it out because I love it so much. Um, so creativity, uh, loneliness, blah. Uh, so I'm gonna say something about that um, only with, through another person's heart. Can you truly see this presence, yourself in the presence of God within you? So it's in, it's so, interesting isn't it in um barbara marciniak's book um bringers of the dawn the palladians so it's channeled through the pink planet palladians they say human beings do better off in a monogamous relationship um which makes that's what that sentence makes me think of when we we're all talking before about uh, are looking in one another's eyes and in that place you can um, really uh, feel the a whole load of um, sensations about yourself and the other when you're just gazing in silence. Um, I would like to maybe do an interpretive dance or something to describe this, which I won't do right now. Um, because it makes so much sense on the on the level i think i'm really inspired by you christine because you've seemed to have um got the ability to you know express some of these concepts which i find difficult to put into words in words and that's really um beautiful to me um and um, I can't remember if I was going to say anything else about this. Well, we can come back to you. I th no, back I think, to you. Well, I think I'm done. And if there's anything else, I'll I'll put my hand up. Okay. So, Conchata, your your take on this one, please. I was thinking about this earlier, and when I was maybe before fifty. I thought of lonely, loneliness as a, a state to be avoided at all costs. And and then I don't know where it 
shifted for me. I'm sure there was something I read, but I realized, what is it? You know, I asked myself, what is the loneliness? What is it evoking in me? And there's an edge of desperation for me when when I identify some myself as feeling lonely. Um, there's a, a sense of being cut off. And, and so then I ask myself, well, who cut you off? More than likely, it was me who just cut off from things. I'm, I, I can't speak for other people. I'm not saying there isn't loneliness, but it's, it's the difference is, is solitude isn't cut off. I think that's what Christine was, was describing, is that I'm not cut off when I'm in solitude. I'm actually... Uh, and, and in loneliness, I tend to shut down and and there is no creativity going on. And the shift comes if I can move that into something, my solitude, and and then it it opens up something in me. So I'll agree that there are two different things. It's very fascinating, though, that, that the rule says that you delude yourself into believing that you are on the right path. Uh, I don't know about that. What? How is it? Other than in loneliness, sometimes I got a good dose of self pity, and and perhaps the old uh, "somebody done done me wrong" attitude, which can often make me feel righteous. I mean that I, I would interpret it that way. Um, and. I'm not saying that I don't see God in other people, but I'm going to agree with you, Liz. I don't see it as the only way because I've been meditating most of my life. And there are moments when ugh, I see things in myself and there's nobody around. And I see the dragons who, who, who have come to breathe fire on me. But I, then I also can see the other side of that is some that I can connect um, with with the essence of God. And so I'm going to agree with you on that one. I don't think it's the only way to do that. Okay. okay. Right, Emily, you were getting a little excited earlier. You were going to say uh, uh, something. Uh, because I was going to ask that question, um, which I'm con when you are lonely, it is easy to delude yourself into believing that you are on the right path. What does that mean? It's a question for all yeah, of you. Well, yeah, what, what does, does that, mean? that mean? I mean, I would I would disagree. I think, you know, having experienced loneliness, you know, I am not thinking about being on the right path. I'm thinking, you know, this is basically, this is shit. How have I ended up here? I feel really lonely. So excuse the, you know, the bluntness there. But in solitude, in solitude, Without the loneliness, it's a lot, lot easier to be creative, to write, to paint, to, to, to function. I think loneliness um, brings a sense of more of a, a lack or an inability or a, a lack in oneself. And you know, you you're there in the pity party. That's that's how I have experienced it in the past. You know, being lonely as opposed to being in solitude. So, um, Christine, what, what's your response to, to Emily's question there? Going on mute myself in the wrong place. Um, I was wondering if this perhaps, this particular statement relates more closely back to the circumstances of Shams and Rumi, because Rumi um, was looking for a beloved to come into his life. And when Shams turned up, it had a profound effect on, um, on the path that he was taking. So whether it means that if you're in that state of being lonely because you don't have a beloved companion or whatever whatever that may me be mean it might not be another person it might might just be a a source of 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 knowing that you acquire for yourself 
But I just wonder if it means that that having someone who takes you out of that self-absorption into a different way of thinking puts you on to a, a truer path and that the presence of um of shams as the kind of mirror that reflected Rumi back to him whether that was that was what this is is kind of generally referring to that we perhaps all need a muse or and that can be good in a muse or an outer muse or whatever um in in order to to help us be guided on the best possible path for us for our, our growth and transformation that's yeah, that was... that makes a lot of sense when you put it into that context. Yeah, it really it really does. Um, yeah, we it's 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 the thing, isn't it? We all we use our own experiences, and you know, Christine, you just took us right back to the time and the place and and what was actually going on. You know, where this rule came from, and that just throws a completely different light on it um and and i suppose that that's part of the discussion we are taking these out of context and looking at them going do they have a value and a purpose now um so i think and 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 also going back to what emily was saying about um translation and meaning of words and different you know there's that in there as well so um, and and i just wanted to add it makes I'm getting the the sense of that. Does it apply? Well, what do I do when I feel lonely? I reach out to somebody or I might mm -hmm. reach out. It, it might be a person. It could be my cat. It, it, <laughs> it could be a book. And that's, there you go. That that's how it, I think that last line applies is that then there I'm getting a reflection back that says, no, you're, 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 stop being so self-absorbed. Look at this. You've got the cat who's saying, hi, I like you. Or, or you're not alone. Um, and it could be as simple as suddenly hearing a song on the radio. I mean, it, so yeah, I can see how that fits today. Yeah, a song, a book. I, I can identify with the, the concept of um, disappearing into a book as well. And I had the same experience with, with my mother looking for me I'm so in a book I never knew anybody was there you know they search in the house looking for me and I'm under a table or under the piano or something like that and nobody can find me because I'm in a book and I'm right there and not hearing anything in that solitude and that but solitude and silence but I wasn't really in this world I was right there where I was reading about and that's a whole other dimension for another day <laughs> So I'm conscious of the time here. So um, final comments So from everybody. Just, just, just all take yourselves off mute and let's just any final comments. Like We could talk, I don't know, about hours. each of them. For, mm. for hours. It, I, I'm just, um, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to find the words and I'm just feeling into what I'm feeling, which is quite satisfied to to have this opportunity to discuss this and um yeah it, it i feel expanded and um a lot more relaxed around loneliness and solitude actually so there you go okay so we get a benefit straight away <laughs> just from the discussion <laughs> Liz, I, I just wanted to say that, that when you were just talking about your um, your places where, where you would go in your book, it, it made me think of, of perhaps we all have our own personal Narnia that we... Oh, yes. Yeah, that we can go, go into the wardrobe and come out the other side. And it's a change of focus and a change in our physiology as well. So a great way to change our state and... and become more loving and caring and listening so thank you it's been beautiful lovely experience thank you emily final words yeah. from you yeah i i feel um rich it's a rich 
um, beautiful opportunity to explore together. That's it. I loved it. Thank you. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you all, ladies. Once again, it has been such a... Uh, a wonderful enlightening discussion and you know I think I've learned lots and I'm hoping that everybody watching on on replay will enjoy the discussion and obviously we'd love to hear your comments as well so um watch this space for episode four coming soon for mm -hmm. the next two rules in the series but um yeah this has been a um, silver tent tv production and um yeah, thank you for watching. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.